Hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Katie and this is where we discuss all things true crime, current affairs and politics. Today we are going to continue with the case of Corey Richens, the children's author who is accused of allegedly, allegedly <laughs> fatally poisoning her husband Eric back in March 2022. Corey wasn't arrested until May 2023 and still sits in jail awaiting her trial. Court, no court date has been set as of yet, so Corey is presumed innocent. And side note, Corey wrote a book about grief following her husband Eric's death. Last week, we went through the prosecution's motion to deny bail. And that was back in June. This week, we are going to go through the defence's request for that bail. So we're doing things a little bit back to front, but uh, you, you got me. You're with me. It's fine. So grab yourself a drink because this is going to be a long one. Okay. So the 9th of June, the... Defence's request for bail. Corey Richards, through her attorneys, uh, has filed for motion to consider bail and set conditions for her release, including the setting of monetary bail if the court deems appropriate. In light of the facts, circumstances and law unique to this case, Corey requests that the court consider her pre-trial release and set conditions for her release. In doing so, this court can order such conditions as electronic monitoring or other supervision that will satisfy any concerns the court or the state may have. In support of this motion, Corey states as follows. She lived in Utah for more than 20 years. Corey and Eric met in March 2009, quickly developed a relationship and began living together in the June of that year. Is that three months? That was quick. In January 2012, Corey and Eric became engaged to be married and their first child was born in July 2012. In November 2012, they purchased a home which, whilst the legal title was put only in Eric's name, Corey also contributed her separate funds to the down payment. That's one of the arguments in one of the civil cases, that it's in his name, not hers. Yes. And um, Eric's sister, who is the executor of his will, for want of a better phrase, there is a different phrase, has said, no, you're not having the house, pretty much. and then it's just a load of legal jargon. Under legal law, legal title is not di dispositive of ownership. Sure, the trial courts have broad equitable power to distribute marital property regardless of who holds the title, according to Utah law. Hmm? Corey and Eric were then married June 15th, 2013. On the date of their wedding, they had a prenup And the first time that Corey learned of or saw the prenup was when Eric's mother pres presented it to her moments she before she walked down the aisle. Oh, I mean, it depends. Like, did they sign the marriage certificate there and then once they said their I do's? Or is that a separate thing? I believe it's a separate thing. Don't you have to go and get a license? Hmm. The prenup was meant to provide a summary of Eric's estate, sorry, assets and debts. It was intended to give a fair, reasonable and adequate disclosure of the assets of, Re of Eric. Under his assets, he listed his masonry business, a forklift, a skid steer, scaffolding, saws, tools, trucks, trailer. Eric listed no other assets. In particular, Eric did not identify the family home as separate premarital property. Okay. 
Well, the prenup also states that Corey and Eric do not now have, possess or claim any right or interest in the present or future income property or assets of the other. It is well established under Utah law that separate property can become marital property when it has been commingled. When the other spouse has augmented, maintained or protected the separate property and when it is fair, just and equitable. From at least September 2013 to March 2022, when Eric died, the mortgage on the family home and virtually all upkeep, maintenance and improvements were paid using Corey and Eric's joint funds from joint financial accounts. Corey and Eric had three children during their marriage. On September the 5th, 2013, Eric designated Corey as joint owner of a credit union account. The account was the main financial account that Corey and Eric used throughout their marriage. They also had several other joint accounts. Um, they used several credit cards during their marriage from various institutions and they were joint credit cards and all connected to the joint bank accounts. Any joint account owner is authorised and deemed to act for the other owner. Any account owner, including any joint owner, may withdraw all funds and or close the account, stop payments on items drawn on the account, withdraw or pledge all or any part of the funds in the account without the consent of the other, i.e. it's dangerous. You should always have your own account. As well as a joint one, don't get me wrong, but you have your own. Similarly, under Utah law, financial accounts acquired during a marriage or containing commingled funds constitute marital property to be equally distributed between the spouses. Marital property is ordinarily all property acquired during marriage and it encompasses all of the assets of every nature possessed by the parties whenever obtained and from whatever source derived. The amended information alleges that Corey withdrew $100,000 from Eric's bank accounts and spent in excess of $30,000 on Eric's credit cards. While the specific amounts and credit cards remain unclear to the extent any such money was withdrawn from the credit union account or any other account held jointly by Corey and Eric, and to the extent any credit card charges were on joint credit cards or credit cards linked to a joint account, all such funds were equally owned by Corey and Eric. In other words, they were not just Eric's accounts. So, Corey withdrew all that money and they're saying, yeah, she was allowed to. What's your point? Mm, okay. Eric's relationship with Cody Wright. October 2010, Eric and Cody formed C&E. I believe that's the masonry company that they own. They each owned 50% of it. They're friends outside of work. They go hunting on a property that Eric owned in northern Utah. For some reason, they wanted this included, but on the 10th of September 2016, Eric shot a bull elk, despite the fact that he had already filled his 2016 elk permit. As a result, Eric requested that Cody tag the elk with his unfilled 2016 elk permit and Cody complied. So Eric shot some that he shouldn't have. Cody subsequently reported the occurrence to law enforcement, which resulted in Eric being charged with wanton destruction of protected wildlife, a class A demeanor. After reporting the unlawful tag, Cody was interrogated by law enforcement. During the interrogation, he made multiple statements criticising or otherwise calling into question Eric's character. An investigation conducted by the Division of Wildlife Resources included a witness interview that provided evidence Eric had been unlawfully obtaining tags in Linda Richin's name, having them mailed to his residence and filing them without her knowledge between 2003 and 2007, and again between 2009 and 2012. Now, I am not a fan of hunting. Just put that out there. But it looks a bit Eric was breaking the rules. But I don't appreciate them 
the defense trying to tarnish a dead man's name when he's not here to defend himself. That's not cool. Mm -mm. In addition to Eric being charged with a Class A misdemeanor, the Division of Wildlife Resources revoked Eric's big game hunting privileges for, for a period of eight years. Eric appealed the decision to the Utah Wildlife Board and subsequently entered into a stipulation and order which suspended Eric's hunting privileges for a period of four years, eight months. As an avid hunter, this was devastating to Eric. As a result of Cody reporting Eric to law enforcement and calling into question Eric's character, their relationship was never the same. You don't say. While they remained business partners, Eric's trust in Cody deteriorated significantly and he did not believe that Cody had his best interests at heart. Well, don't ask your best friend to do something illegal, allegedly. But again, Eric is not here to give his side. On or about August the 23rd, 2023, the masonry... Um, company was ordered to pay over $600,000 after an investigation by the US Department of Labor found the company violated overtime rules by paying workers straight time for all hours worked. The company was additionally cited for failing to maintain records of hours worked each day and week as required by the Fair Labor Standards Act. So they're accusing that they didn't pay their staff correctly. Yes, this does put into question someone's character, but Eric wasn't the only person in charge of the company. And again, he's not here to defend himself. It just doesn't seem fair to me. Don't see what this has to do with his death, whether it's homicide or he took his own life. Nothing to do with it, in my opinion. Hi, uh, future editing me. This video was stupid long, so I'm going to be cutting it, in, cutting it into parts. This was the first part. I appreciate your time so far. Next episode, we're going to start with Eric's alleged drug and alcohol use, according to the defence. So thank you for your time. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next one. Share the video, let me know below what you think, has anything changed your mind, and this fluff ball is Piccolo. Big, big. <laughs> um, thank you for watching this one, I'll see you in the next one.